600,000 medical collaborators from Cuba have worked in 165 countries over six decades. On May 24, Cuba marked the 60th anniversary of its unique medical brigades. Next story, we discuss China's two-month investigation of U.S. chip company Micron Technologies, which has ended in a ban. And finally, a hectic week in Brazil's Congress, fault lines between far right and center that controls Congress and President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva's supporters came to the fore on Wednesday night. More than 600,000 medical collaborators from Cuba have worked in 165 countries for six decades. On May 24, Cuba marked the 60th anniversary of a unique international collaboration that began in 1963 in Algeria and has provided healthcare and health services around the world since then. Anna from the People's Health Movement discusses why this has been an important work by Cuba. Anna, great to have you on the show and it's an important sort of anniversary being marked by Cuba. Now, the, the international outreach of Cuban doctors has actually meant a lot to global health movements, it's meant a lot to people's health movements. Can you tell us why it is so significant? Uh, I think it's significant for many, many reasons and you know, uh, so uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, the Cuban Minister of Public Health was at the World Health Assembly and he was giving a speech uh, where he mentioned that uh, Cuba, despite all the problems, was actually uh, able to achieve health for all. Uh, health for all is an ideal that the WHO boasts for decades now uh, that it strives to achieve, uh, but very, very little, mem uh, very, very few members of the WHO can actually say that they met, uh, they made significant progress towards this goal. And one of the reasons why uh, Cuba was able to do that uh, is because of this very specific understanding of health, of what health should be and how it should be achieved. So it's not just a technical part. It's also the re revolutionary impact that uh, the right to he health should have and that uh, the role of the health workers is actually uh, to help people to achieve the best health that they can. Um, the way that they approach this is, again, very different from uh, what the Global North sees and for what the Global Nor North pushes on a global scale. Uh, it's based in the community on primary healthcare, so actually on collecting the experience and addressing the problems of the poorest of people and making sure that the poorest of people uh, have adequate access to quality healthcare and that the quality healthcare isn't only available in cities as uh, it is in many, many other parts of the world. And uh, inside this whole story, uh, the specific story of the uh, Cuban Medical Brigade is very specific because uh, it kind of uh, undermines the whole narrative about the health worker migration and, in, uh, and it undermines the uh, you know, the, the approach that uh, the world has had uh, to how we can support other countries in times of crisis, but also at times where uh, just the health system doesn't work because of lack of funds or something like that. Right, Anna. So a very local approach to uh, solving the immediate health problems so that they do not you know, snowball into giant crises, which we see in many parts of the world, as well as a international outreach. Uh, why did Cuba decide to go with both these approaches and, and how has it made a difference? Well, the, the community part, uh, it's actually, uh, it's something that's recognized at least formally uh, as having a good impact. So, you know, um, if you talk to a very mainstream group of uh, health uh, health policymakers, they will say, oh, of course, you know, primary healthcare, community outreach, that's, that's the way to go. Uh, but we haven't seen that Im implemented in many uh, places. Uh, also because it's... Um, because it uh, the the community based the primary healthcare based uh, approach it actually reduces the amount of space that you have for the private sector it's uh, or, or at least it uh, reduces for a bit uh, the mm, the profit driven uh, logic that's behind uh, many many uh, health systems in the world so that's on the one hand, but the international part is something very particular, I would say, because it's uh, it really draws from 
uh, from how Cuba approached other countries uh, very, very short after the revolution. So one of the, the first mission uh, that was sent uh, was to Algeria in 1963. Uh, and this was, you know, it's uh, it was something that was a bit unplanned. So if you read the interviews from the people who went there to Algeria, uh, they said that the, it was mostly unknown. So they didn't know what to expect. They didn't know what uh, they would find when they arrived to Algeria. Uh, but this uh, this drive to actually go and help and uh, build a health system in a country where it needs uh, it's something that uh, that comes uh, from the revolution. I think that one more thing that's important to underline is that you know uh, when we say uh, uh, when we usually talk about uh, medical aid, international medical aid or right. um, international humanitarian actions that approach health also in a way. Uh, it's something that's very, uh, it's something that, that comes from the outside. And then when it leaves, it just leaves health systems as devastated as they were before. This is not the case with the Cuban International uh, Health Brigade. So uh, their role is actually to come there to help b build the health system. So it's a health system that stays there. Uh, they're also not there to stay forever. They're there to staff the health system until the country in question has trained its own health workforce, which can then drive the health system further. Uh, and it goes a step beyond that because uh, Cuba actually offers medical training for people from the global south, uh, for countries from the global south who cannot afford that. So uh, for any country who doesn't have the, the money, to support public training of its own health works. Uh, the Latin American School of Medicine uh, is there free of charge uh, to train uh, hundreds and thousands of health workers who then go back and actually uh, actually stop the health system. So it's a very particular, it's a very positive story in global health, a bit unusual, unfortunately, uh, but it's really, uh, it's really an important anniversary that we have marked this week. Right. It's not just unique, but also unusual, which is a sad part that it hasn't spread as widely as uh, perhaps people like you in various health movements would really want it to. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, we can say that it has spread. So over the years, over the past 60 years, it has uh, the Cuban health workers have reached uh, I think somewhere around 165 countries in the world. This right. is, you know, it's an enormous reach. And let's remember also that among these countries, we should also count some global North countries like Italy, uh, who wasn't, a who weren't able to cope with some health emergency, uh, emergencies like the COVID-19 pandemic at the beginning. Right. So it's, um, in this way, uh, the Cuban health brigades have reached a tremendous, you know, a part of the world. Uh, the problem is that uh, they're often not talked about, uh, as much as they should have. Uh, there was the initiative to, of, of course, award them the Nobel Peace Prize because of the work that they did uh, during the pandemic. But then if you look at how they're painted, usually, especially in the corporate media, it goes in a very different direction. So it's uh, uh, even tried to use uh, as a way to discredit Cuba and the work that it does internationally. Uh, but what we know is that it's a program that has tremendous potential that, you know, it makes uh, an incredible difference. So uh, Cuban doctors and nurses and dentists, uh, other health workers, they have treated millions of people. Uh, in the last 60 years, they helped deliver 2 million babies. Over 2 million babies uh, were delivered by Cuban health workers working abroad. So it's something that's, uh, you know, really building towards strengthening international solidarity and showing that socialist health systems actually work. They work better than the ones that we, we have in capitalism. Right, Anna. Thanks a lot for joining us with that. Thanks. Late at night on Sunday, China announced it is banning Micron Technologies, a U.S. company. Chinese companies won't be able to buy the company's chips, and China has cited relatively serious cybersecurity problems as the reason. According to reports, these problems were identified after a two-month investigation in China. It's important to remember at this point the Joe Biden administration's banning of numerous Chinese companies throughout last year. Bappa Sena joins us in the studio with some possible outcomes of China's steps. So, Bappa, it's been a while since we discussed the chip wars between the United States and China. What's also different this time is that it's China which has barred a U.S. company. How did this come about? Why does it matter? 
things. Yeah, so uh, just I think this week, China banned uh, Micron uh, from providing uh, chips to Chinese infrastructure providers, right? So it's a, it's not a full-fledged blanket ban. It's meant for only that targeted um, segment, which is the so-called infrastructure providers. Uh, Micron is one of the leading manufacturers of memory chips and uh, NAND chips, which go into SSDs. Um, so this is uh, clearly seen as a retaliation for the various um, chip sanctions which uh, U.S. has done against China, right? There were, uh, uh, the U.S. has been ratcheting up the so-called chip wars against China for a while now. It started during the Trump administration in 2018, 19, it first targeted Huawei, which is right. a, a leading manufacturer uh, of telecom equipment and smartphones in the U.S. So they uh, banned Huawei from getting access to high-end chips. Um, like cell phones have fairly high-end high -end chips. So if you want to be competitive in the cell phone market, you're competing with the likes of, let's say, uh, Apple or Samsung, um, you would need the latest chips, right? Okay. And so Huawei was banned. Uh, but then when the Bush administration, uh, sorry, when the Biden administration came, uh, there were uh, much more blanket bans which were not targeted at particular companies, but um, the latest uh, of these bans, uh, um, of these sanctions happened in, uh, I think, last year, when uh, basically the Bush, uh, I keep on saying Bush, basically the Biden administration uh, said uh, limited US, uh, Chinese access to all high-end chips um, and mani all uh, manufacturing equipment for high-end chips. Okay. So they are effectively trying to starve China from access to uh, any high-end chip. They are defining it as 16 nanometer and uh, less. Uh, th see, the, the, the most advanced chips today uh, the chips which Apple uses in its, um, in its uh, let's say, computers and cell phones, they're at five nanometers. So okay. 16 nanometers is really two, three generations behind the highest end chips. And uh, US is cloaking in this in language of that they want to deny uh, Chinese military access to the chips. But really these high-end chips are meant for everything, right? I mean, a very small fraction of the chips actually get used by the um, military. So this is really... Uh, uh, action by the U.S. to try to cripple Chinese access to high technology and eventually, I mean, uh, in, in the world we are today where, uh, where it's very dependent on digital and tech products, uh, effectively trying to cripple Chinese economy. Right. And um, so this has been going on for a while. Now, for the first time, we are seeing China retaliate. That's right. Now, this is actually China saying that, look, we have the companies that use chips and we can deny you access to our market. But there was also, you know, Bapa, there was a two-month probe. What made the probe necessary into the activities of Micron? Uh, what did they really find? What do we know so far? See, the, apparently they did a security review. Right. And they're claiming that Micron did not pass the security review. And this right. is exactly what the United States says about, say, Huawei. They uh -huh. said that consistently. About, about um, uh, th that this is the exact language yes. U.S. uses to ban access to uh, Chinese companies, or China access to... Uh, Chinese companies' access to um, uh, these chips. So, see, China holds... Um, it's, n it's not that U.S. holds all the cards. So, U.S. has... Um, uh, U.S. sanctions are, uh, are defined in such a way that not only U.S. products, but any product anywhere in the world which touches U.S. in some way, right? So, if you... See, these are complex products. It re they require... Uh, design equipment, manufacturing equipment, testing equipment. So any place in the supply chain, if your product touches some U.S. technology, then it gets covered by the U.S. sanctions, right? Okay, so if the chip part of it is made or designed in, say, any country in Europe, so China can't access it. Uh, right. For example, see, this, some of the most advanced chip manufacturing equipment comes from a company um, called ASML in Holland. Right. Now, some... So, so this is a... Very complex product, and it uses different technologies from all over the world. Now, some of the technologies are patent, patented in the U.S., and so then U.S. says that you can't sell the product to China, right? Okay. Um, so 
US does hold a fairly strong hand in this thing, but the, the Chinese retaliation comes from the fact that 40% of all semiconductors manufactured worldwide, the end market is China. Okay. So, so by denying access to that market, China can really cripple the chip providers. And so now, the, the, this is the first step, this kind of Chinese threat that if you, if you uh, continue to do this, then we will, I guess, escalate the, the retaliation. So uh, Micron is, 11% of Micron's revenues come from China. Now they've carefully chosen Micron uh, because the chips which Micron produces, uh, they are produced by other companies. Around well. the, Micron is not the sole supplier of this, right? Okay. So, for example, the Korean companies, both Samsung and SK Hynix, produce me memory chips which are as good as whatever Micron produces. So, um, so they can easily source it from them. Also, Chinese companies, like uh, there is a company called um, YMTC, which, who's, uh, which has technology on the NAND chips, which, which, which go into SSDs, uh, SSD drives, their NAND technology is at par or better than Micron's. Okay. So this is also going to basically promote their own companies, right? right? And um, so US, uh, like, uh, uh, for example, US has now asked Korea, uh, like Samsung and SK Hynix, to not replace the- Micron. The, the, the Micron, the, the, the the amount of chips they are going to lose, uh, like that, that vacuum that is created because that 11% of Micron's uh, revenues, uh, chips worth 11% of Micron's revenues were going to come into uh, China and now most likely go to Korea. And so US is trying to stop that. But the Koreans are uh, hesitating. Clearly right. it's a market share they want. It's a very hyper competitive market and the margins are very low and you really can't afford to let go of these opportunities. Papa, thanks a lot for joining us with that update. Indigenous movements and environmentalists in Brazil have declared strong opposition to legislative proposals by the conservative-dominated Congress in the country. Congress is pushing for an early vote on some proposals, including one to annul indigenous claims on land older than 1988. It is also pushing for a draft law that would allow the Justice Ministry to delimit indigenous territories. A commission of inquiry into the MST or landless workers movement has also started in Brazil amid accusations of political motivations. Zoe from People's Dispatch discussed the heated debates sparked in the country by these moves. Well, it has been a tumultuous week uh, in Brazil, in the Congress. There's been many different investigations, many different votes that have happened uh, that is really bringing to light this, this kind of battle between the far right and the center, which controls Congress. And of course, uh, Lula, who's in the executive, and many of his supporters, which are in Congress, which are the minority. Um, so one of the key uh, areas and the kind of attacks that happened this week um, was about um, different uh, regulations regarding access to land, regarding um, what is considered as indigenous land. So uh, to talk specifically about this, um, there has been a bill on the table for uh, several years. That's the um, Bill 490. This bill essentially, it, it's called um, the time framework about indigenous demarcation. Indigenous demarcation is essentially um, the reference point which uh, says what is count, what counts as indigenous land and what does not. So essentially this demarcation, this uh, bill that uh, far right and centrist are trying to pass uh, in Brazil, it's, it essentially says that what was considered indigenous land and where indigenous people were inhabiting in 1988 is the only land that counts as indigenous land. And uh, this has been opposed very, very strongly from indigenous movements, from environmentalists. Um, essentially, this has been a bill that's promoted by large landowning class, the, as they call it uh, in Brazil, the ruralist caucus in the Congress. Um, uh, many indigenous organizations say that in uh, 1988, that's not really when indigenous history starts. And of course, this is discounting 400 years of dispossession 
of displacement of indigenous people that occurred during colonialism. So uh, essentially this week, it was this bill wasn't passed, but it was on the night of Wednesday, May 24th, um, the the Chamber of Deputies ruled to have an urgency motion and say that this should be voted on um, next week. Um, and essentially, they're trying to have the vote on this bill 490 before it gets seen in the Supreme Court, uh, which will happen on June 7th. Uh, they essentially are probably guessing that it will be ruled unconstitutional and that this time framework regarding indigenous demarcation of land will not pass. And so they're trying to pass it in the legislature where they have control, where they have a majority uh, in order to pass this. Um, and it's really bringing to light, as I said, this major dispute between the legislative body uh, and the executive and um, the judiciary. Uh, again, this is promoted by the Ruralist Caucus, a large landowning class that essentially sees the indigenous demarcation as protection over land that they should have access to in their eyes. They want it for illegal mining, they want it for uh, logging and all of the other activities which are attacking the environment. And so this again has met, has been met with widespread rejection. Even the Minister of Environment, Marina Silva, made a very, very strong statement in the Chamber of Deputies while this was happening and saying that uh, this is an attack on those who defend the environment. It's erasing the history of Indigenous people. So this is going to be a very, very hot issue. Uh, the voting, again, is going to happen next week. Of course, there's many stages that it needs to pass through before it becomes a law. But Indigenous movements have raised the alarm. They're saying that this is a direct attack on their rights. They have called for mobilization in the capital Brasilia. So this will be a very important story to follow um, and, and will definitely be continuing to follow as people dispatch. So just to briefly review some of the other major developments that have been happening this week in Brazilian Congress, uh, as we've been covering um, the Commission of Parliamentary Inquiry against the Landless Rural Workers Movement, MST, began this week, uh, very, very intense debates uh, about less about the kind of subject of the inquiry, which is essentially or says that it's trying to get to the bottom of who funds the MST, what's its motive, et cetera. Again, this is, as the MST has pointed out, this is very easily accessible public information. It's not something they hide. Uh, they're funded by the people who are part of the movement, et cetera. But there has been a lot of debate within this uh, Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry more about the nature of the movement itself. And so a lot of the uh, left-wing groups in, in Congress who are participating in this, in this CPI uh, have been questioning the validity of the inquiry, have been questioning the motives, specifically the political motives of the far right that is actually promoting this. And several members of this uh, inquiry commission have even been uh, implicated in the other a uh, major development just happening in Congress this week, which is the beginning of the investigation into the acts that happened in Brasilia on January 8th, where uh, hundreds and hundreds of Bolsonaro supporters invaded the Capitol and destroyed uh, several government buildings and wreaking a lot of havoc there. So an extremely active week. We'll be following again. Um, you can check out on our website and also on our partner's website, Brasil de Fato, uh, who's covering this very meticulously. Uh, very important to follow. We're really seeing this uh, clash between the far right and the center that has been able to be in power under Bolsonaro, under Michel Temer, and now they're being threatened, of course, by Lula's presidency, who's threatening their interests, threatening many of the things that they were doing very happily under Bolsonaro, destroying the environment, having access to more land, uh, engaging in environmentally unsound activities. And so uh, this is all coming to a head and it will continue to develop over the coming weeks. And that's all we have for today. Thank you for watching Daily Debrief. Do come back to us tomorrow and do follow us on our social media channels and keep watching. Thank you very much.